Hello, everyone. So, hello, everyone. Um, so now I'm going to make a quick announcement by the UN. Even though we are online, we have to make this announcement. Um, so I will read it now. As you are all aware, mitigating the risk of spreading COVID-19 during the Congress requires the cooperation of all of us. In line with the COVID-19 prevention concept elaborated by our host country, Japan, and the Secretariat, I would like to kindly remind you of the following precautionary measures. Fill out the contract tracing information sheet found on your assigned table or seat. Maintain at least two meters of physical distance from each other when not seated at your assigned seat. And avoid gathering in groups. Wear your F FP2 mask at all times for in-person meetings. You may only decide to take your mask off when you are given the floor. Do not attend the meeting if you are unwell. If you feel ill during a Congress session, contact the medical personnel stationed in each conference room. These measures are in place for the safety of all of us. I thank you for your support and attention. You may now start your ancillary meeting. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so this is Mami. Uh, thank you very much for joining our ancillary meeting today. Uh, our uh, session title is Stop the Bomb on Children, Protection of Children in Conflict by Compriving International Law. So my name is Mami Kawaguchi from Save the Children Japan, and I will moderate this session. So we are very glad to have this uh, precious opportunity with you. As the title of the session suggests, through this session, we would like to uh, discuss to protect children in conflict by complying with international law. If you have any questions uh, during the session, please insert your question in the chat box of this platform. Please specify which speaker you will, uh, your question is addressed to. We will try to answer as much as possible during the Q&A session time, but we may not have enough time to answer all the questions. We appreciate your uh, understanding. So first of all, I would like to begin with the opening remark by Mr. Hitoshi Kikawada, who is a member of the House of Representatives. He is the Secretary General of the Parliamentarians for Kyoto Congress 2020. Mr. Kikawada, please give your opening remark. Okay, thank you for uh, your introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, honorable guests, my name is Hitoshi Kikawada, member of the House of Representatives. I have worked for the Kyoto Congress as Secretary General of the Parliamentary Association for making the Kyoto Congress 2020 successful. The overall theme of Kyoto Congress is advancing crime prevention, criminal justice, and the rule of law towards the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Under this theme, effective measures to deal with threats faced by international society, such as organized crime, corruption, and terrorism will be discussed. I would like to emphasize here that rule of law is very, very important because effective laws becomes useful weapons for the weak, such as children. The importance of the rule of law is also emphasized in the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. The Goal 16 of Peace, Justice, and Strong Institutions addresses the necessity for strengthening the rule of law to end all forms of cry violence against children. International law could play a vital role in protecting vulnerable children who are exposed to the various, various forms of violence and threats by war and uh, conflict. We should not forget that the 2030 Agenda also states that 
we affirm our commitment to the to international law and emphasize that the agenda is to be implemented in a manner that is consistent consist with the rights and obligations of states and the international law. At this very moment, many children are suffered from armed conflicts around the world. Children are affected the most by such violence, even though they have no responsibility for it. Conflict changes children's future totally. I heard from Japanese NGO Terra Renaissance a story about child and a conflict in Uganda. A 12-year-old boy was keep, kidnapped by an evil terrorist organization and forced to being a child soldier. One day, he was ordered to attack his native village and to kill a woman. However, that woman was his real mother, unfortunately. He denied the cruel order strongly, but in the end, he had to chop, chop off his mother's hand instead of killing her. After four years since the tragedy, he was res rescued from the terrorist organization. However, he could not live with his, his mother again because his mother died from the wound suffered by him. This is a true story. This is just one of the million cases of how children are the killed, maimed, and injured, both mentally and physically, by conflict. As a member of international community, we need to we need to take make effort together to protect children forced to live under conflict today. We need to take concrete actions together to save many suffered children. It is responsible for national governments to uphold international law to help children spend in normal lives. In this event, I hope that we discuss and reconfirm how the laws play a vital role to protect, protect children living in conflicts. To close my speech, I would like to express my gratitude to ex ex excellent speakers, Japanese youth, all the participants, and Japanese NGO, Save the Children Japan, to prepare for this variable session. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Kikawada, for mentioning the overall theme of the Kyoto Congress, the rule of law and SDG 16, and how important international law is for protecting children. So, before starting the presentations, I would like to ask you two questions by using the polling function of this platform. So the first question is, uh, can you start the polling, please? Um, the first question is, how many children in the world do you think are affected by conflict? Maybe you can uh, answer the polling uh, through the po uh, polling system. So about a half of Japanese population, 60 million people, about the same as Japanese population, 120 million people, and about twice as much as Japanese population, 240 million people. 
And the last option is more, more than three times as much as the Japanese population, 360 million people. Please answer that question. Thank you very much for answering the questions. Okay, so the many people answered that about twice as much as Japanese population, 240 million people. Okay, I would like to uh, move on to the second question. The second question is, in which part of the world do you think children are most, uh, most affected by conflicts? Uh, so this is the second question. The option is the Middle East area, African area, Asian area, and the Latin American area. Please answer the question. Okay. Uh, thank, okay. For thank you for cooperation with the uh, answering the polling. So answers are a bit divided. So uh, including answers for these questions, uh, Mr. Olg Bromkist, humanitarian policy and advocacy manager. Save the Children International will explain the reality of children affected by conflict and the recommendation of Save the Children. So, Olf, the floor is yours. Please give your presentation. Thank you very much, Mami. And uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for letting me speak here today and for bringing us all together for such an important event. Uh, before I start my presentation, I also want to thank um, Representative uh, Kikawada for his very powerful uh, opening remarks and uh, his uh, his uh, how he highlighted the need to protect children in conflict uh, uh, around the world. I also really want to thank uh, Mr. Tomiyama from uh, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for his presence here today. Could you go to the first slide, please? Thank you. So I, I'm, I'm going to set the stage for our meeting today a little bit by, by talking about what we at Save the Children are observing about the state of children in conflict zones today. In short, the outlook for children in war is, is not uh, a good one. Uh, like with so many other things around the world, ch children often have the least to do with starting wars, wars but suffer the worst consequences. At Save the Children, we've been tracking numbers on how many and how children are affected in wars over the past few years, and I will start by going through some of the main trends we have observed. As you can see, and as you heard from Mami before, the numbers of children in conflict zones are shocking around the world. In 2018, there were about 450 million children worldwide who were living in a conflict zone. That is about one out of every six child in the world. This includes about 149 million children who live in high-intensity wars. That's uh, conflict zones where we see more than 1,000 battle-related deaths every year. It's also worth highlighting that this, these numbers have really increased over the last few years. Uh, we've seen a five-fold increase since 1995, an increase by almost one-third just in the last decade. Geographically, war affects children everywhere, uh, but there are some clear trends. Um, as you, you might have guessed from the last question, Africa is actually the region where most children are affected by, by, by conflict. Uh, with 170 million children in 2018. It's closely followed by Asia at 165 million. The Middle East, maybe unsurprisingly, has the highest proportion of children affected by conflict. We estimate that almost one third of all children in the Middle East live in the war zone. Um, in terms of individual countries, the four countries in the world where we see the most children in, in, in high intensity conflict zones are Nigeria, Mexico, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Afghanistan. I will talk a little bit more about uh, Afghanistan later in this presentation. Because of this, this crisis of protection and, and because of how much children suffer in, in war, uh, a few years ago, Save the Children launched one of our global campaigns called Stop the War on Children that aims at better protecting children living in war zones. Um, we produce annual reports to, uh, along with this campaign, and we, we do a whole host of other activities. And I'm particularly looking forward to hearing from the young activists who will be speaking later about how they have been involved in this campaign. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Great. So that was a quick overview of the numbers. In terms of the trends we observe in, in conflict, um, I'll, I'll talk through some of the main ones here. 
Uh, one thing that's really important to highlight is the fact that the nature of conflict is, is changing. Um, conflict is changing between from wars between states. Instead, we are seeing much more intrastate conflicts or, or civil wars instead. Conflicts are also becoming much longer and more protected. The Syrian conflict is arguably the highest profile conflict in, in the world right now. It's, it's already lasted longer than World War II. Afghanistan has lasted longer for, for more than four decades. Um, and we also need to stress that com conflict is becoming more urbanized. Increasingly, violence is taking place in cities as opposed to the open. These trends all have devastating consequences for, for children. The longer war lasts, generally, the harder it is for children. The more the longer war lasts, the more we see a breakdown of society and we see a breakdown of uh, key services. Access to food becomes harder, access to healthcare becomes harder. And, uh, and actually what we see today is um, there are many more children who die in conflicts from disease and hunger than from other causes. Um, it's also worth looking at the numbers in terms of violations against children. And this is also something that's increasing over the last couple of years. In 2020, the UN reported more than 26,000 violations against children or incidents of the six, six grade violations. These include uh, killing and maiming, recruitment, abduction, sexual violence, attacks on schools and hospitals, and the denial of humanitarian aid. But other than the direct consequences of war, children also really suffer a lot of the indirect consequences. The, like I mentioned before, lack of access to key services like uh, education and nutrition can really harm children's development and growth. Um, um, some people also become increasingly aware of is the mental health impact of conflict. We, we in, in a lot of wars, we have a whole generation of children who grow up traumatized and who know nothing about war. Um, in, in, in a piece of research we did on Afghanistan last year, we interviewed children about their experiences in war. And one of the most shocking findings was the fact that where children felt the most afraid was actually not, uh, not at home or not in the open or in the market, but, but when they were walking to and from school. So that tells you something about the constant fear they live under. It's also important to highlight the impact of COVID-19 on conflict. Uh, we're only really beginning to understand this. Um, in 2020, UN Secretary, UN Secretary General Guterres urged uh, a global ceasefire during the pandemic. Uh, but unfortunately, this was not well followed. In Asia, we can point to some short-lived examples in Thailand and the Philippines. But generally, war continued uh, it, at the same or even at a higher pace than before. Uh, COVID has affected children badly. The most marginalized children find it harder to access services. We've seen a real spike in domestic violence. But when it comes to conflict deaths and how, it's, how, it's really, how COVID has really affected conflict, we're still trying to find out more. One indication and one quite alarming indication is that last year in a survey of 26 countries where NGOs and UN worked on uh, work on child protection um, in 21 of those countries uh, UN and NGOs reported that conflict or political instability had escalated since the start of the pandemic but like I said there's more research to be done here before we before we know wh wh what's actually happened finally it's also really crucial to consider the gender aspects Bo boys and girls experience conflict differently uh, Girls are at much higher risk of sexual violence and other forms of gender-based violence, including uh, early and forced marriage than boys. But boys are much more likely to be exposed to killing and maiming, for example, or much more likely to be abducted or to re be recruited as child soldiers. One important thing to mention here is that the violations in girls often happen in, in hidden spaces and, and in secret spaces, such as in the home, for example, sexual violence. Uh, which are often much more difficult to um, to document, whereas violations with, against boys are, are easier to, um, to to research. Could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, just to briefly focus on some of the key conflicts in Asia we're following in Save the Children. Um, and I want to hone in on two of these. So one is the conflict in Afghanistan, and one is the conflict that originates in Myanmar related to the Rohingya minority. Like I mentioned before, Afghanistan is one of the world's longest conflicts, and in 2019, it was the deadliest conflict in the world for children. There were 2,600 child casualties in Afghanistan that year, including 760 killed. Humanitarian needs are on the rise alarmingly in Afghanistan. There are 10 million children who need aid just, uh, just uh, this year. We've seen a tentative peace process start last year, but there's no real sign of violence reducing around this. 
there's been a small drop in civilian casualties, but at the same time, we've seen an increase in, in other tactics like targeted assassinations of human rights defenders and journalists and so on. Um, so it, it, it's really, unfortunately, Afghanistan has disappeared from international headlines a lot, but it's really one of the wars in the world where needs are the strongest. In, in terms of what's happened in Myanmar, um, I'm sure a lot of you on this call will be aware of this, but there's the Rohingya minority group that has been discriminated against for decades in Myanmar in 2016 and 2017. Really horrific violence by the Myanmar military against the Rohingya led to thousands of deaths and drove more than 800,000 people to flee into Bangladesh. So at the moment, we're looking at a child rights crisis on both sides of the border. In Bangladesh, you have Rohingya children who grew up in refugee camps. Uh, in, in deplorable conditions, without access to education, without much hope for the future. In Rakhine State, Rohingya children live in a situation that can only really be called apartheid. Um, and I think one of the real tragedies of this conflict is that it's really been an, an, an example of international failure to act. In particular, the UN Security Council has been almost paralyzed when it comes to the Rohingya, uh, Rohingya crisis. Could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. But it's not all bad news. Uh, it's also really important to highlight a lot of the progress we've seen and a lot of reasons to be hopeful. One thing I do want to highlight are uh, the number of international treaties that are incredibly important for children. The Safe School Declaration, for example, is something we work closely on with Save the Children. We're very happy to see that more than 100 countries have signed up to that now. More than 110 countries have signed up to the Paris commitments to protect, child, protect children from into armed forces better. Um, and at least 170 countries have signed up to the optional protocol to the Convention on the Rights of the Child to protect children in armed conflict. Um, and the CRC itself is, of course, the most endorsed protocol uh, in the world. Sometimes it can be easy to be cynical about these commitments and um, say that they only amount to, to pieces of paper. But we have seen that they have real effects in, in practice as well. And for us in civil society, Crucially, there are really important frameworks to engage governments on, and they provide standards to hold governments to account to. Something else I want to stress is that we've seen some real progress on accountability and international justice. Far too often in wars, perpetrators of really horrible violations are able to escape free. But in the last few years, there have been some real signs of hope on this. In Myanmar, for example, there are a few different uh, international justice processes that are happening. At the International Court of Justice, there's a case brought by the Gambia against Myanmar for violating the Genocide Convention. There's an ICC investigation into Myanmar. Uh, and some countries are looking at uh, universal jurisdiction cases. In Afghanistan, there's also an investigation into uh, by the ICC. Uh, and something that's really important and something we've seen is that there's increasingly a recognition in these processes that the violation against children deserves special attention. So if you look at the mandates or if you look at the experts on these process, in some of these processes, increasingly you have dedicated resources to violations against children. And finally, I also just want to stress that we're seeing better monitoring. Uh, the UN Special Representative on Children in, in Armed Conflict is an incredibly important mandate. The annual report produced by that office is, is very effective in naming and shaming and holding perpetrators to account around the world. And we've also seen uh, dedicated uh, teams in, in many conflict zones to monitor violations against children. It's not a perfect system. There's a lot of valid criticism against it, but they do exist and they are very important tools. And there are lots of countries we can point to where they are incredibly effective and, and have, real, uh, have real impact, not least in Myanmar. Could you go to the final slide, please? Thank you. Uh, and just to conclude, how do we want to move forward and what are our recommendations to international governments and save the children? So we've identified three main trends that we're really, we really pushing in terms of our work on conflict. Um, one is uh, upholding international standards and laws in conflict. And I think my colleague from ICRC will speak more about this later. Second, as I mentioned, international justice, the importance of really pushing for perpetrators to be held to account and breaking those cycles of violence that often maintain conflict. And the third one has to do with practical steps to really take action to protect children in conflict. This is everything from funding humanitarian response plans to refugee response plans 
to making sure that services to protect children, whether it's child protection and mental health are in place in conflict, and also to help children to recover after, after war with mental trauma. And finally, it's really important to listen to children and to involve children themselves uh, and to make sure that uh, children's own opinions and children's own experiences of conflict are taken into account when we, when we talk about how to respond to this. Um, I'll finish there and hand it back to you, Mami. Thank you very much for listening to me today. Thank you very much for your presentation. So as all of just presented, many children are being harmed by conflict. So now I would like to introduce the voices of children affected by conflict. This time we focused on the voices of children in Syria and Yemen, where conflicts have been prolonged for 10 years, triggered by the Arab Spring, which happened in 2011. لما في بحس بخوف كتير نطلع نلعب أنا ورفقاتي بس ما نلعب مثل بقية الأولاد لأن كنا خايفين كتير وما نعرف وين ده يروح لأن ده كان ده يقتحم الجيش إدلب وبعد ما استقرنا ما إنه وين نروح ما عاد نعرف أكتر شيء اللي يخليني خايفة إن القصف والطيران والجيش إنه يتقدم ل لمحل ما نحن قاعدين و ونخاف كتير إنه أكتر شيء نخاف منه القصف والطيران والجيش إذا يجي مثلا يعتقل الشباب ونشرد كمان ننزح من من هون إلى مكان آخر. شو أكتر شيء بيخليك سعيدة بهيك أيام؟ أكتر شيء خليني سعيدة إنه نلتم كل ياتنا سواء كل العائلة تلتم تحت سقف واحد ونعيش بأمن وأمان. طب. أنا أكثر شيء بدي أرجع عن مدرسة مشان كمل دراستي وحقق حلمي يصير أنسة وعلم يعني علم طلاب ويصيروا دكاترة أو أنسات أو أي شيء. أنا من سوريا طفولتي قبل ما تصير الحرب كانت كويسة يعني طبعا لأني كنت عم بدرس كان في ترفيه شوي من روح يعني على الحديقة وهالشغلات مناطق صارت الحرب ونزحنا من بيتنا بيتنا انضرب ورحنا على بيت خالتنا نحن وثلاث عائلات بالبيت وضلينا سنة عندهم ما عاد يستحملوا ما في مصاري وما كان أبوي عم يشتغل ما في مصاري طبعا. قالوا لي أخواتي كان عيّت أهلي ضلّنا سنتين وبلا دراسة وبلا شيء يعني هل الحرب كلياته ما كان في دراسة طاول طبعا إذا كملت دراسة إذا كملت دراسة لبعض ما تصير عمري 18 تقريبا هيك شيء إذا أخذت شهادات توزع توظف يعني أتوظف على المنظمات وهدول والله أنا بحب ناصير كمحامي أنا تغيرت حياتي وقت صار القصف كانت حياتي متواضعة حيز يعني يعني كانت يعني طلعنا من دير الزور على إدلب من إدلب جينا على المخيم حياتي يعني وقت جيت هنا زين حياتي أحسن ما كنت بالدير قبل الحرب كنت أروح المدرسة بس صار الحرب ما عاد أقدر أروح المدرسة وقال لي أبي يعني لا تروح المدرسة خالص يعني فيها تضرب الطيارة المدرسة ما يعني أنا كنت ببيتنا بيتنا كبير حيل يعني متواضع بين نلعب نضحك نمزح كان زجار وكل شيء يعني استاذ وبعدها يعني جينا على المخيم هنا وكل هاي كل ما هاي تور خيمة وكل ما هاي تور ونريد نرحل على الحسك أنا أتمنى يعني نرجع على ديار الزور نلعب مع ربعان يلعب مع هاي هنا يعني ما العيشة هنا صعبة يعني الأطفال السوريين حالتهم صعبة حيل يعني كل واحد يتمنى يرجع على بلده 
واحد اثنين يرجع على بلده ويلعب مع ربعانه وهذا ال... يعني هذا هذا بيته مهدود هذا بيته محروق يعني تا يرجع وما يموت صار تا يرجع تا يعمره يعني بدهم اذا بدهم مصاري تا يرجعون يعمرون وتا يرحلون من هنا اطلب من العالم يعني نرجع على بلادنا ونصير مثل الاخوه الساس ليش يعني وقت جينا من من دير الزور يعني حيل كانت حياتي مو زينه صعبه يعني اتمنى سترجي ترجع علينا ونرجع على بلادنا هل انا واثق انه راح الوضع يصير بسوريا يعني ما راح ترجع سوريا علينا يعني ما راح يصير الوضع من مثل اولي مثل ما كنا بدير احنا كلنا الأبياء القورة وزيدنا من أب الحاجة صعبة أفشك أنا أحاي يجينا ويعرف ويجينا ويعرفي نعم أنا يجيني إلا جانت دولة أيام وعملية راسي هذا الشباب في راسي ليش أتمنى أن الحرب يوقف أن الأطفال يعيشوا نحن كيفيون نلعب على الرفقة في الطاوي كنا كيفيين كثير من شيء أسبوع ضرب البامير كلنا تنهزمنا في عالم ما لد في عالم لا ونتخافان كثير كثير بصرنا نخاف و... والأرض من تحتنا رجعت وإيش اسمه و... ونحن غمنا نزحنا لهون وهذا هو الحقيقة Okay, so to protect the children who are injured by conflict like this in this movie, young people in Japan have already started to take action. Miss Ikemoto, a first-year university student working with Save the Children Japan Youth Team, will give a, give a presentation on the activities and what youth in Japan can do to protect the children in conflict. So Miss Ikemoto, please give your presentation. Thank you, Kogichi-san. I'm very glad to be here today. Today, I'd like to talk about what I have learned through my activities with the Smoke Youth Team. Please let me introduce myself first. My name is Ayana Ikemoto, a senior at Keio University. I belong to a seminar. I belong to a seminar regarding international law, and I am particularly interested in international humanitarian law. Ever since I was a little, I have been interested in working for emergency humanitarian support, such as medical assistance for children in conflict. I wanted to work for an international NGO or a UN organization in the future. And one day, I came across international law. I came across international law and was fascinated by its universality and scale. Therefore, I decided to study it. The year before last, I participated in a workshop on children in conflict organized by Save the Children, which led me to join in Swok Youth Team is a youth group to promote Swok campaign in Japan. So far, we have held so far, we have held workshops for university students and working adults on that, and have also made policy recommendations to diet members. 
in the next slide, I'll talk about the question for studying international law. International law is a law that regulates the interest of the nation. However, I kept thinking, what is the point of learning about it? I show in the video earlier, the fact that happening now is that there are many children who want to go to school to fulfill their dreams but can't, or who can't go back to their own home. Even though I wish to support such children, visiting a war zone is not something a commonplace student like me can do. It is also impossible to visit refugee camp in neighboring countries now. In such a situation, I have been thinking, what can I do by learning international law or what can I contribute to society? Through my participation in the smoke use team activities, I was able to find one of the answers. It is promote international law or international humanitarian law in the form of policy recommendation. As part of the youth team activities, our youth team had a chance to have a dialogue with the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs and members of the ruling and opposition parties. Policy recommendation is a process of making recommendations to policy makers, mainly direct members, on how to address certain issues on related policies and projects. Throughout our activities, we learned that there are many children in conflict who want to get an education opportunity but cannot. Therefore, one of the things we have been appealing for throughout dialogue with the, di with the Diet members is the Japanese government's support for the Safe Schools Declaration. Safe Schools Declaration is a document formulated in 2015 by the government of Norway and Argentina which includes the prohibition of military use of school data in session. International humanitarian law prohibits deliberate attacks against things that have no military interest. Sadly, however, many schools are destroyed every year by airstrikes and, and in some cases are used as military facilities because of their strong construction. Currently, more than 100 countries have upheld, upheld the declaration as Japan has yet to do so. Therefore, we have been loving our legislators for Japanese endorsement. Next, I will talk about the significance of the school, safe schools declaration. When I studied international law at the university, I felt that the field of international law, especially international humanitarian law, has been, has been developed by the request and demand of the international community. Examples of this are the Convention on the Prohibition of Antipersonal Mind and the Nuclear Weapons and Treaty. Some people may wonder what is the significance of Japan, a peaceful country without war, upholding the Safe Schools Declaration. However, I like to mention that it is a great message to the international community. In Japan, as one of the G7 countries upholds it, and considering the fact that the international humanitarian law has evolved in line with the movement of the international community. Japan's endorsement is very significant. That is why we have been working hard to achieve endorsement by, Japanese, by the Japanese government. Safe schools declaration will not only protect children and schools in Japan, but also it will appeal to the international community to prohibit attacks against schools and to respect the international humanitarian law, including the protection of children. I'd like to talk about what I felt through the SWAP USTM activities. The SWAP USTM, which started in the fall of 2019, initially had three members, but through the connection continuation of holding workshop and sharing information through social networking site, the team has now grown to over 15 members, students of different grades and majors who came together with who came together with a common interest in children in conflict are now trying to spread this issue to society. As I explained at Swok Youth, we we had, the we had the opportunity to talk with NGO workers and diet members. It was also a valuable experience for me to have the opportunity to talk, not only with young people, 
but also with people who are actually working in the field of international cooperation and policy makers, and to share our idea with them. And today, I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you something in Japan. As I have been mentioning throughout my speech, there are young people like me who are show, showing interest and working for humanitarian support to save children in conflict. So if you have an opportunity to get involved in Japan, I truly hope that you will tell people about the existence of young people like me and the members of the Swapius team by spreading our network with everyone here. Uh, even if it's little by little, if these connections spread from our own small community to a different region to Japan, we may be able to contribute to the promotion of international humanitarian law, which has been possible for a single student to do. In advocacy, there is a concept called reminding, which means to keep saying, please don't forget, even if we cannot achieve a certain policy or project immediately. I have, I have learned it always takes time for society to change. I believe that, I believe that by cons constantly expanding the circle of people who are interested in supporting children in conflict, people will take over my wish and remind constantly and repeatedly to one day accomplish my goal. In Japan, there is not, not much coverage of conflict and people show little interest in children living under conflict. However, there are people like us who are speaking out and working for the support of children living under conflict. I'll be entering the Graduate School of Law next month, where I'll further study international humanitarian law and research support for children living in conflict situations from the perspective of law. Together with the Swap USD members, I'll think about what we can, what we can do here in Japan for children in conflict. Once again, it would be a great pleasure if you could let people know that there are young people like us in Japan and share this information anywhere you go. And I believe that our such activities will surely lead to protect children in conflict. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ayana, for your powerful presentation. So now I would like to ask one more question to all of you. So this is the third question. So here is the question. Please move on to the polling, uh, the very bottom, uh, the right side of the polling. Please put the polling stop. And there is the third question. The question is to protect rights of children in conflict. What do you think needs to be strengthened in relation to the law? So the, this, there is a, a option. So the first one is strengthen international laws to protect the general public, including children in conflict situations. The second one is strengthen national legislation, uh, sorry, registration in conflict affected, affected countries. And the third one is strengthen compliance with existing international laws by con countries in and around the con uh, conflict zones. And the fourth one is strengthen mechanism to pursue those who violate children's rights in conflict situations, such as through monitoring and reporting mechanism and criminal trials. If you have uh, any, any other uh, ideas, please write in the chat box and send it to us. So now many people answered to the third options strengthen compliance with existing international laws by uh, countries in an around conflict zone. Yeah, thank you very much for cooperation with the uh, polling. So as you can all see, answers are also a bit divided here. So all of these are important to protect the children and the need to be strengthened, but I would like to ask Mr. Sabios, the representative of, of the ICRC in Japan, to explain the role of international humanitarian law in particular. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabios. Floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me on behalf of the International Committee of the Red Cross to join this conversation. 
Uh, I would like to start first by, by really much highlighting uh, how moved I was by hearing the voices of these children from Syria, Yemen, and Iraq. Uh, I think there is no better way of explaining why it is so important that we are all gathered today to discuss this very important issue of protection of children and to remind everybody how important international humanitarian law can be and the positive difference it can make for these children. But before going into international humanitarian law and, and how we can uphold uh, responsibilities uh, in, in protecting children, I would just like to complement what uh, Olaf says around uh, what is the situation of children around the world today. So if you could just move to the next slide, and uh, I will just uh, uh, highlight a few points as many were already highlighted by uh, all of But uh, I think among the main trends we see, and I think they are important, unfortunately, uh, I mean, if we look at the situation since the last 2019, we have seen an increased number of conflicts, according to the ICSC. And the conflicts are becoming increasingly complex, and we have close to 100 conflicts uh, around the world. I mean, there are more than 60 states involved, and there are foreign interventions, the use of proxies, and you name it. So the situation which are becoming increasingly difficult and complex. What we also see is that these conflicts are now extending into the digital space, and they become longer, murkier, and more fluid. So we're speaking about this, this uh, nature of conflicts which are becoming more and more protracted. I mean, just for you as an example, I think the ICOC is its most largest operation, the third largest operation around the world, present since more than 35 years. And you can imagine what this means. I mean, first it means that the state has still not found a way to responsibly move from conflict situation to peace. And I think this is one of the main problems why we have so many children still suffering from conflict uh, today. Uh, what we also see is that these conflicts are happening increasingly in the urban area, in high density, high area. And of course, this has a huge impact on uh, uh, the children. And I also want to underline around this complexity the fragmentation of groups that we see. According to the ICOC today, there are more than 600 armed groups around the world operating. And an organization like ours is speaking to more than 465 of them. There are, according to us, also close to 66 million people who are living today under like the governorship of a non-state armed group, which also gives you an idea of the difficulty to operate in environments like that and bring in this protection for children who so much deserve it. But very much, or, or uh, I think, worrying for us is uh, the fact that um, the the law is more and more being questioned and the protection of children are the basic principle of international humanitarian law are being questioned under sort of an excuse of exceptionalism, exceptional situations. And I think this is why it is so important that in a UN Congress like that, we come and ask this what I say that we remind about the importance of the law and the difference it can make for uh, people. And I also need to mention, and I think because this directly affects the capacity to protect children, it has become more and more difficult to deliver humanitarian assistance and to just conduct neutral, independent, impartial humanitarian action in situations of armed conflict. There are, of course, huge security concerns, but at the same time, there are also a lot of uh, constraints that are being imposed, administrative constraints, counter-terrorism legislation, and again here, these are all impediments to uh, uh, protecting children in armed countries. If we look at more global challenges, we also see, of course, that uh, children are suffering for the conflict, but on top of that, they are the victims of many other uh, pressures, like climate change and environmental degradation. You have also, of course, today COVID pandemic, which had a huge impact, uh, probably, I think you have read the, the, the figures from, from, from UNICEF, like 168 million children haven't been to school last year, so which you can imagine the crisis of education that it represents. If you can just move to the next uh, slide, please. And of course, if you translate this whole situation into the reality of humanitarian needs, you will realize that this is totally unfortunate, and I think we should all be ashamed about these figures, 
that today we are 235 million people in need of assistance in, two, in 2021. And this is a 40 person. And in a decade, and I think this is the children's uh, figures, the number of children killed or wounded in conflict was by 300 persons. It's just huge. Extreme poverty rose for the first time since the last 22 years. By 51 million internally displaced people, 26 million refugees worldwide, 40, 20 million children are facing risk of conflict. And uh, according to a, a, a report that we, we are launching today on after 10 years of Syria, uh, of Syria uh, you will see that 57% of the 1,400 people we surveyed reported that they, meet, they were missing years of education if they went at all uh, to school. So this is a decade of loss for an entire generation, a decade of displacement, a decade of having a mental health uh, pressure problems, the economic security problems in a country like uh, Syria. So overall, I think, and this is the reality of what we see today, and despite all the efforts made by the international community, there are growing gaps between the humanitarian needs and the capacity to ICSP to respond. So if I come now to the next slide, and what can governments and what can we do to better protect children? I would, I would like to say that uh, I think we, we really have to come back to basics. And uh, it was said in the last presentation that remembering is very important and reminding people about what exists is extremely important. So the first thing I want to do, and I think we will all agree on that, and again, if we listen to these testimonies from children from Iraq and Syria and Yemen and many other parts of the people of uh, countries around the world, we will all agree that children are particularly vulnerable. And this is why they were given and are entitled to very special respect and protection. So I think the very basic principle is to respect the best interest of the child. And I think another thing which we have to keep reminding is that a children should primarily be seen as victims and not as perpetrators. And in that sense, I think the ICOC being present of, in very close proximity to all these children in the situation of armed conflict, we see on a daily basis the achievements and the positive difference international humanitarian law can do when it is being uh, applied. You see, and, and, and this is something which we see when, for example, we have uh, children who can go to checkpoints, I mean, just to reach a hospital, when children can get food delivery, when children are basically uh, uh, demobilized from an armed group and are being reintegrated into the society. So the law is possible, and the law makes a real difference if it, if it is being applied. Unfortunately, when it is not the case, then it has huge consequences for the different uh, uh, children around the planet. And this is where I think there are a series of uh, 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 actions to take. So if I would answer in a very simple way to what we can do basically to better protect children, I would say that the simple act, uh, uh, answer is respect international humanitarian law. And here again, as a reminder, all countries have universally ratified the Geneva Convention. So I think this is something which uh, they have the responsibility and an obligation to implement. If we look now uh, at, at what uh, uh, concrete action we can take, I think, and some were also mentioned in this uh, latest poll, and I think they are important. I think we have to expand the universal ratification of the Geneva Convention to other IHO treaties, including the 1977 additional protocols to the Geneva Convention and the optional protocol on children in armed conflict to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And I think the ICSC does many inputs in that sense in the different countries where it is operating. We also have to reinvigorate the many ways governments implement international humanitarian. And in that sense, uh, you might know that the Geneva Convention are 71 years old. And at the occasion of the 70th anniversary of the Geneva Convention and the International Conference of the Red Cross and Red Christian Movement, we basically call for all states to renew their commitment to unequivocally, but also universally uh, renew their commitment to implement 
international humanitarian law. And I think here, Japan, like all countries around the world, can do that effort to bring international humanitarian law home and it better known, understood, promoted, and respected. And a very important uh, 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 thing is for all armies around the world and non-state armed groups to integrate international humanitarian law into their military practice. Because I think international humanitarian law has not been designed for glossy books standing into uh, nice apartments. Uh, in international humanitarian law has been designed for these murkier conflicts, the diff more difficult places, and this is where it will make a difference for people and for children affected by the uh, uh, country. So we also have many more efforts to do to promote international humanitarian law within academic titles, within think tanks, within youth associations, within ministries. And I think also something which is extremely important looking into the future is that all states be responsible enough to develop weapons which are basically compatible with the rules of international humanitarian law. So uh, the ICC has been quite strong in reminding states that IHL would be also applicable in cyber warfare because it will have an impact on civilians, on population, and on children also. Something that I want also to stress is uh, Article 1 of the Geneva Convention says that a uh, state should uh, respect but ensure respect for international humanitarian law. And here I think there is far more to be done by states to ensure when they are in partner operation, part of a coalition, that all their partners really do everything possible, again, to include international humanitarian law into their military practice. If we want also to have greater protection for uh, our children, I think that states should facilitate and help neutral, independent, impartial humanitarian organizations and NGOs to do their job and just depoliticize humanitarian action so that we can reach out to the most vulnerable. And of course, when I think about most vulnerable, I think here again about the uh, children. And one thing I want also to stress, I think, and it is very much central, I think that is a, a total declaration that has been taken by states. There are a lot of commitments which have been taken, some of them directly directed towards more protection for children. So I think if these all states can turn these commitments of this total declaration into practical action, I think we will make a huge difference on a daily basis for the children. Last slide, please. When it comes to what the ICLC can do to promote greater respect for IHL, I mean, I already mentioned it, so the ICLC made a call to states to renew commitment to universally and inequivocally respect IHL. I mean, at the, at the occasion of the 70 years of the Geneva Convention. And I think this is something where we are now trying with each state and together with the huge network of the Red Cross and Red Cross National Society. And here I have to commend the Japanese Red Cross Society for the work they do in promoting international humanitarian law within, I mean, their huge uh, network of, of, of volunteers. I think we are asking each state to ask themselves the question, what can we do here in our country, be, be it a country at war or be it a country at peace, to contribute positively to greater protection of people in armed conflict and children in particular. And I think this is clearly an exercise that we are hoping to be able to conduct at the National IHL Committee, uh, uh, committee of, of Japan, which is being chaired by MOFA and by the Japanese Red Cross uh, Society. At the ICLC also, as you might know, we, we engage on a daily basis with all parties to the conflict to promote and respect uh, IHL. So when we, I speak about this huge number of non-state armed groups and armies around the world, I think this is our duty to basically engage with them, share best practices, make sure and demonstrate the difference uh, uh, international humanitarian law can do for the people, but I think they are also the fundamental basis if we want to get out of the situation of conflict and get into more difficult uh, discussions, which could bring back uh, a peace and a greater future for the next uh, generation. Something very important that was mentioned is that if, I think that if we want IHL and greater protection for children, 
we need support from people, organizations with skills and competencies. So I was extremely pleased to, to, to listen to the youth which are mobilized in the same uh, the children network. There are universities in Japan that are competing in the IHL mood code competition. And I think there are many more sort of networks that we have to mobilize around this issue because again, I think it concerns us all and not only people in situation of armed uh, country. The ICLC also has a very specific um, uh, responsibility together with the movement of the Red Cross and Red Veterans to re-establish links among family uh, members. And I think this is something extremely important. I think children suffering for being separated from their families. I mean, this is a very difficult uh, issue and problem for, for children. And I think if I look again at this study that we are, this survey that we are, we have just launched on Syria, I think two out of five Syrians have lost contact with the family members. So you can imagine what it would mean to live with not knowing where your, your, your beloved ones uh, are. And so together with this network, we try to establish this contact. We also try to look after people who would have gone uh, missing. Something which is also very important and obligation under international humanitarian law is to promote the principle of non-recruitment of children by armed groups and uh, their obligation also to reintegrate them uh, um, when demobilized. And we also very much push states to think about using detention for children only as a last resort. And I think in that sense, there were many good practices um, during this COVID-19 crisis of children being released from detention and from states trying to find alternative solutions to detention for children. In that sense, he also a link to the reestablishment of family links. The ICRC also works a lot in trying to reestablish the contacts and keep contacts among people who are being detained and family members. And I think here we should strongly focus on the children who sometimes have their fathers or mothers being detained or are being separated again because of detention issues, or are themselves having to accompany their mothers into the, the, the jail. It was said by Olaf, but I think it's very important also that we do listen to children, that we do give them the chance to speak for themselves. And in that sense, this is very much at the center of the ICOC community based approach, whereby we try to have the communities and children in particular engaged from the beginning of designing the programs and the response that we will give to their problems and trying with this dialogue to really respond to what are their needs. And you could listen to these children, basically all they are asking for is being able to live in security, being able to have an education, and just being able to have a future, which is what all our children uh, uh, would, would, would basically uh, uh, like uh, to have. And just here to underline that children are make up 40% of ICRC beneficiaries. I'm just taking here an example. We are working in camps in Northeast Syria. 62,000 people, two thirds of them are children and, uh, 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 and women. And this is just very much illustrative of the situation of children who are now, because they are associated with terrorist groups, basically are under very lot of pressure of having sort of the protection they deserve not being given to them because again they are labeled under this terrorist group. So we really have to stand all together as an international community to make sure that the protection and the international protection that all human beings deserve on this planet be respected by all states and everybody wherever it is uh, 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 today. So I will stop here, just remain within uh, time. I'm happy to take uh, more questions, but thanks uh, again for the invitation. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabios. Uh, he, so he just explained the importance of international humanitarian law, and the next Japanese youth will also appeal the importance of complying with international humanitarian law. So Mrs. Suzuki of Utsunomiya University will give us a presentation on what she thinks through her studies at the university. So Mrs. Suzuki, please start your presentation. Yes, thank you, Mrs. Kawaguchi, 
having me. Nice to meet you. My name is Hitomi Suzuki. I'm an undergrad student at Zoom University. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me as panelist in this very event. Today's my presentation theme is What I Can Do for the Children Living in the Conflict. Please, next. My career plan after graduating from Zoom University uh, is going to graduate school to learn overseas journalism study and join internship. I'd like to for protecting affected people in the conflict using media too and give our hands for people who cannot raise their voices. Please next. First of all, I introduce about myself. I measure international studies and belong to a club called UIPJ, Tsunomiya International Peace and Justice under Professor Fuji's guidance. I'm interested with international humanitarian problem since I watched one movie at YouTube. This movie is that one female named Park Yomi, who escaped from North Korea, spoke about various violations against humanitarian law which she received in her country. I was very surprised and shocked the fact there are people like her who violated fundamental human rights in, in the same world with me. So I entered college, which I can learn about international issues and the law, which determines those situations and protect human rights. For two years at Tsunami University, I committed a refugee project, joint learning meetings about refugees' history and law structure, unit shared activities, and gave a presentation about what Japan can do for the refugee theme is providing certification system. And at UIPJ, did infection and peace human rights project made a poster about COVID-19 and ever virus theme is lesson from past pandemic for our new life. Additional for global week SDG webinar related SDG 16 peace and justice. Please next. However, for two years at Tsunami University, I felt difficulties of humanitarian support through learnings and cannot grasp how I use media too to resolve international issues. I speak about what I address and I tackle at the university following this bargain. Now, I'd like to learn about human rights and how it applies with the real case. So, preparation for participating in Nelson Mandra World Human Rights Moot Court Competition. Please next. And I'd like to join Professor Fuji's lab at Uzunim University. I can learn my interested field. Professor Fuji's lab students have been to Netherlands and now planning to go to Uganda as lab's activities and learn international human rights law, international humanitarian law, Peace building and ICC International Criminal Court ATEC. Till now, they have participated in various competition, events, seminar, and done SDGs project for the children. Please next. Today's main topic: our activities. One, ICRC IHA Mood Court Competition. Second, SDGs project for children and light. Please next. First. Join the Met Court competition held by ICRC, International Committee of the Red Cross, at two times. In this competition, participants divide into prosecutor or defendant and make arguments according to each law. We consider how humanitarian law is used in the conflict situation. Please next. Last year, I joined IHU Moot Court Competition as support member. Provided case are Count 1, Attack on Civilian, Count 2, Attack on Medical Worker, Count 3, Use of Child Soldier. I took charge of Count 3 and land IHU which protect children and prohibit using of child soldier. Example, Commission Geneva Charter 8. Prohibition that under 15 child is used in armed conflict. While I learned, what I felt difficulty is that methods to clarify child's social age are little. Additional, I felt 
even if they are child soldier or voluntarily join armed groups, IHR protect them and prosecute perpetrators who use child to take part in hostilities. Please next. Second, lead project which teach Japanese children about human rights through workshop. This project theme is university students connect with SDGs and religion. Operate human rights workshop for the children theme is body and physical punishment. Participated in competition of town development and received first prize. Through their participants in this SDGs project, the university students were able to make connect connection with children in the community. It was fun to conduct human rights workshop with the children. I have a bit at my presentation, so if you have some questions about this project, please ask my respected senior named Leona Fukuhara, who belongs with Professor Fuji's seminar. She's here today. Please next. I'm doing a thesis project for the by Utsunomiya University to contribute to our region, mobilizing our daily studies, decided to develop the project in this year too. Same is about the light of children in the conflict. Now we are planning to go to Uganda and deepen the understanding of post-conflict situations. We would like to provide opportunity to think about their light to Japanese children because of COVID-19, we cannot do face-to-face -face activities, so make video as educational tool and distribute, distribute them in regional school. Please next. Third, joined international humanitarian law play held by ICRC in 2019. In this competition, participants play various law, example, humanitarian support group, legal group, and expect different fictional situations to discussion and negotiation. Please next. Both join various events or seminar, university students, member of a society, let's think what we can do for the education in the conflict. Held by Stop the War on Children's Walk Youth Team. We have participated many times and made a connect with the Save the Children, so I could get the chance to speak here today. And sustainability of society and gender sexuality, what can we do in Shona session number 34 held by UN University ATEC. Please next. Through these activities, I learned and felt difficulties when international law apply for the real case and Protecting neutrality and as a complex situation such like the conflict is very hard. Moreover, limitation of the ICC, the UN, or the NGO exist. It is necessary that stakeholders negotiate with government, but the reality is that not all nations are cooperative, and it is a very complex issue. Last, lack of support and interest of the international community. Despite the fact that there are victims of conflict all over the world, information is not sufficiently disestimated. And concern and support do not reach them. So for the future, I hope I could work for providing necessary information. Please next. What can we do for protecting the children in the conflict through these activities? As general answer, strengths IHO domestic law. Since international law is complementary, the development of domestic law is important. I think it is that we as students continue to study how to solve issue which children in the conflict face. Please next. I'm so appreciated with joining and speaking as parents in this event. I will continue to study and act for the people who are affected from armed conflict. And now planning to hold on symposium is same is view of WHO. How is this organization deal with COVID-19 situation? Please join. Thank you for the Save the Children. Thank you very much, Hito. I hope that we will continue to promote the importance of international humanitarian law through, throughout your future career. 
So now I would like to ask the Japanese government to com comment on the strength of Japan in protecting children on conflict. So Mr. Tomiyama, Director of Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs Division, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, please comment on this point. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tom, uh, Mikito Tomiyama, Director of the Human, uh, Human Rights and Humanitarian Division of Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in Tokyo. Uh, thank you for having me uh, to participate in this side event of Kyoto Congress. Uh, it's my honor to talk about efforts of the Japanese government in protecting and promoting uh, children's rights in armed conflict. Uh, the last year marked the 20th anniversary of the adoption of the optional protocol to the Convention of the Rights of the Child on the Involvement of Children in Armed Conflict, and the 15th anniversary of the Landmark Security Council Resolution 1612, which instituted the monitoring and reporting mechanism uh, on grave violation against children in armed conflict. However, it is regrettable uh, that Children affected by armed conflict continue to experience grave violations and abuses. Japan urges all parties to armed conflict to fully comply with the obligation under the international human rights and humanitarian law. Currently, COVID-19 is posing additional threat to the most vulnerable segments of society, in particular, children in armed conflict. Japan is alarmed by the lost opportunity for their education, increased risk of their recruitment and use or exploitation, and further delay of their release. Japan strongly urges all parties to armed conflict to immediately respond to the Secretary General's calls for a ceasefire and ensure safe, timely, and unimpeded humanitarian access to children affected by conflict. So now, I'd like to share some ex examples of Japan's contribution to uh, the fund to end violence against children. Through this uh, fund, uh, we have contributed to the project uh, by providing psychological support, case management for unaccompanied and separated children, and reintegration assistance for children uh, formerly associated with armed groups in Nigeria and in Uganda in 2018. Well, recently, Japan has decided to donate around $1.4 million uh, to the same fund for the project of protecting ch children from violence during COVID-19. Uh, we expect uh, such global efforts to spread and will ultimately lead to the end of all forms of violence against children. Japan is determined to continue making every effort to achieve the target 16.2 of the SDGs, namely to end abuse, exploitation, trafficking, and all forms of violence against and torture of children, and to realize human security, human security for all children. I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tomiyama, for your comments on the strength of the Japanese government. Thank you very much. So uh, we still have uh, about uh, five minutes to have a Q and A session. So. Uh, so far, I cannot see any question in the chat box. So do you have any co comment or question to the presenter speakers uh, on our pre uh, session? Okay. Um, maybe, uh, can I ask one question to Olaf? Uh, since the time limitation of the presentation, I think uh, you cannot really uh, explain about the detail of the program or project of the Civil Children International or Civil Children Asian Region. So that uh, could you like to uh, briefly uh, explain about the project or the program uh, of the Asian Region or Civil Children International uh, towered to protect the children in, in conflict? 
<clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot, Mami, for that question. Um, so, Save the Children, we're present in uh, at least 15 countries across Asia, and we work in uh, in a lot of conflict zones uh, across the region. Um, and we, I think one thing that I've been very impressed with Save the Children since joining is the fact that our work is very broad. So we're, we're involved in development work and we're involved in humanitarian work as well as human rights work. Um, I think when it comes to protecting children in conflict, it's, it's worth looking at a lot of the work we've been doing in uh, in both Myanmar and Bangladesh to help uh, Rohingya children in Rakhine State, for example. So in Rakhine State, um, we have uh, this a situation where almost 130,000 Rohingya, including about 70,000 children, are living in IDP camps, uh, which in reality are more like internment camps than IDP camps, because they're essentially not allowed to leave. Um, and Save the Children is one of the few organizations that's been able to provide uh, education in those camps, for example, uh, because um, the, that education is not provided by the government of Myanmar. So it's uh, it's an opportunity for, for those children to have uh, some kind of future. Um, in Bangladesh, we also have a very large presence in Cox's Bazar, where we work uh, directly with the almost one million Rohingya refugees that are living in, in southern Bangladesh there. We have a very wide range of services. I think one, one important thing to highlight is that uh, last year in July, we opened one of the first dedicated hospitals in Cox's Bazar to treat, um, provide, uh, provide treatment for COVID-19 to, to both refugees and to the host community. That, that lives in Cox's Bazaar. Um, and, and, and I think one other thing that's important to highlight that's maybe not directly related to our programming, but it's more related to, to our advocacy work and our global work is that um, we really try to push very hard for accountability and for international justice when it comes to the, the Myanmar crisis. So Save the Children has been very active in, in, with, uh, in the UN context in Geneva, for example, um, and in working with other stakeholders to really highlight the scale of violations that happened to, to children in 2016 and 2017 and, and, and pushing for, for the very strong need to hold perpetrators to, to justice. Um, and of course, in Myanmar today, we're in the, in the very, very difficult situation that a lot of the people who were very credibly accused of having committed these violations against Rohingya in 2016 and 2017 are now actually in direct control of the country following the, the coup that happened in, in February. So it's, it's a real reminder of just how important uh, international justice is and how important it is to hold people to account for these kind of violations, um, to, to break these cycles of violence and make sure that uh, perpetrators are not put in a position where they're able to uh, reoffend and to commit the same violations again. Uh, I'm not sure if that answers your question, Mami, but I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much for answering my questions. So I would like to also ask you, Mr. Sabios about the activities of ICRC. So um, I'm sure that the, you have the vital law uh, to expanding the uh, uh, international humanitarian law. And I would like to ask you that... Uh, and then I'm, I also understand that there are so many positive changes uh, through your activities. So that uh, what I want to ask you is, could you tell me the, like uh, any uh, specific case or the, any specific country's case that you have changed to the positive difference to the uh, protecting uh, children in conflict? I hope my question is clear. Yes, uh, it, it, it's very clear. I, th I think there could be uh, a lot of different cases uh, we could uh, we could mention, but uh, I, I will try to concentrate on a few. And um, I, I think if we take uh, a situation like South Sudan, for example, we have cases of children who have been demobilized. I mean, they, they were basically recruited as child soldiers. They were arrested, then we were able to either visit them, but more importantly, then we were able to reconnect them with their families, and uh, they were then uh, reintegrated through their families into a more normal life. I think this is this is one example. In uh, Syria, in, in Iraq, for example, also, the ICOC visits uh, many different places of detention, and of course, there in these places of detention, there are the very specific vulnerabilities of men, women, but also sometimes children when, when you have uh, 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 families or, or women who, who are also uh, 
uh, uh, being uh, uh, arrested. So this is another example. And I mentioned before this, this northeastern part of Syria, this, this, this 62,000 people who are in camps in absolutely dramatic humanitarian uh, conditions. The ICC there, together with the Norwegian Red Cross and the Syrian Arab Christian Society, has opened an hospital for medical care. We are also having mobile clinics. So we are having primary health care. These are all activities uh, we are conducting. But overall, again, if you look at our activities uh, uh, worldwide, I think the specific vulnerabilities of children are always taken into consideration into the way we approach communities. I think we could also speak about another very good example is all what we are doing in terms of facilitating access to education. So if you take Ukraine and the line of contact, for example, I mean, many children, again, couldn't go to school because of the of the shelling, and then when things have come down, we have put in place programs, we have reinforced structures for people to basically get acquainted on how you can live into this difficult situation and still keep having sort of a normal life and access uh, uh, to education. And this is, of course, I mean, in parallel to all the efforts we do in terms of promotion of international uh, humanitarian laws with the parties to the conflict. Thank you very much. I would also like to ask uh, some questions to Ayana and Hitomi, but uh, unfortunately, the closing time is coming. So I'd like to move on the summary of this session. So now I want to, uh, to ask you that uh, uh, the, the last question in this session to everyone. So please uh, move on to the polling uh, function system. So please uh, answer the first question. Uh, which is, so after joining the session today, what do you think uh, you can do together with your stakeholders, children and youth to protect the children in conflict? In particular, uh, please answer the question, assuming that you are in a legal or policy making situation. Uh, there, there is, uh, yes, four options. Uh, one, organize events related to law development and policy making with children and youth and disseminating uh, information and the rights awareness. And the second one is strengthen efforts to protect the law by co uh, collaborating with children and youth across borders. The third one is work with children and the youth to advocate towards their governments for uh, legis legislation and policies. And the fourth one is strengthen the system and the implementation of court proceedings to hold the children and the youth accountable. If you have any other uh, ideas, please uh, put your idea to, uh, to the chat box. Thank you for answering the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so the answers are also a bit divided, uh, but uh, as you all know, uh, these are all important. So um, now uh, we will continue to work with children in conflict as well as with youth and children in other countries to promote efforts to protect children. So I have to close this session. So again, so thank you very much for joining our event today. I would like to show my appreciation to all of Ayana, Mr. Sabios and Hitomi for their presentations. And I would like to also thanks to Mr. Kikawada and Mr. Tomiyama for the, their opening remark and comment. As members of the international community, we needed to comply with the international law and work together to protect children in conflict. I hope that today's session will contribute in some way to protection of children in conflict. So thank you very much for your joining. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>